Welcome to the podcast. I got vaccinated. I'm very happy about it. I won't sing anymore because that is not what I do. But I did get vaccinated. I am doing this episode today to encourage people to get vaccinated. I got a real doctor on, not a Facebook doctor, an actual doctor who went to actual medical school. Uh, And we're going to talk about vaccines because um, I think they're important. I would like to see some of the uh, suspicion and skepticism around vaccines, particularly in the African-American community to be dispelled. There's a history for that. There's a reason for that. Uh, There's a reason for the skepticism, but there are also reasons now uh, why we should trust medicine and science and why these vaccines, uh, why we should take these vaccines. Um, It's time, everybody. Come on. So my next guest, uh, Dr. Cheryl Rue, an actual medical doctor, uh, is going to talk to us about that. Here I am with my friend Cheryl Rue. Welcome, Dr. Rue. Thank you. Thank Thank you you for being here. So I just mentioned in my intro that I waited in line for three hours uh, to get on an overflow list of vaccines. So I got registered. I waited uh, in in line for three hours. I made the cut. I am now fully vaccinated. I am thrilled about it. You, uh, you've long been vaccinated, right? As a healthcare provider. Oh, definitely. I was vaccinated the first week in December. Yeah. So here, here's what I want to talk to you about, because uh-huh. we keep hearing about vaccine distrust. Let's just start first things first. Okay. Tell us that these vaccines are safe. Are they safe? Oh, definitely. So the vaccines, um, you know, I think many people's perception is that we just started on these working on them in March of 2020. You know, and when we had all the talk, we're going to speed up the vaccine, we're going to get them ready. Um, People's ideas that that just started in March of 2020, when it certainly did not. We have been studying the SARS viruses, you know, from way back even before 2008, when we had the initial. And so it's been in labs. We've been testing. We've been working. It wasn't a rush to do so because we didn't have a pandemic. And as you know, some of the funds and departments were cut. And so it didn't stop the progression. It just slowed it down. So then when the pandemic came, yes, that process was speeded up. Now, when we say speed it up, it means that instead of researchers having to wait for their money to come to them, the money was already put into their account. And so they could proceed with all the same steps that we do normally when we create vaccines or new medications. So no steps were cut, no steps were changed. It was, it was all the same process. I think that's a really interesting point that you made. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's something that a lot of people don't always appreciate. We think yeah. that people started paying attention to COVID-19 on March 13th of last year when the world shut down, when in exactly. fact, uh, the scientists, the doctors, the researchers, the virologists, mm-hmm. yeah. they've been looking at strains of this virus for a year. So it's not like we got all these vaccines in 12 months. We just sped things up. Exactly. Exactly. Let's talk a little bit about um, why uh, people of color, in particular African-Americans, seem to be distrustful. There's a lot of talk about this in the medical community. There's talk about it in the larger community. I don't know if you saw that Saturday Night Live a few weeks ago, um, where it was basically a sketch about how uh, lots of Black folks don't want to get vaccinated. Um, What... Where do you think that comes from? I think you and I know where that comes from, but I think the audience needs to understand that this isn't just, you know, mm -hmm. paranoia. I mean, there's a real history of Black people being abused by the medical system. Is that what you think accounts for this current distrust? Um, Definitely. Okay, so definitely. So that's a part of it. And there are some other issues along the way too. But the mistrust that comes from... Um, African-Americans or Black folks um, being um, unfairly treated, unfairly um, denied vaccines um, because of their skin color, right? Um, Those studies are real. Tuskegee is real. It, It not only was the government, it was also physicians, right? And so that part 
is heartbreaking, heartbreaking, but not unreal um, because institutional racism is current today. You know, I experienced the same when I was in medical school. So it's not hard for me to believe it, right? Um, so that definitely happened. And so when you have, even when polio, when the vaccine for polio came out, um, black folks, we didn't give it to black people because they said, well, they don't get polio. Well, they wouldn't have known we got polio if they had gone to the black hospitals to check to see that we have polio too, but we weren't in mainstream hospitals. So we were denied the polio vaccine for a year before they started giving it to black folks. So black people have a right to be skeptical, the right to distrust, um, a right to be hesitant. But what we try to tell people is this is a new day. It is a new time. You know, back then we didn't have doctors that looked like me and you. We didn't have doctors of color that were on the front lines that were making decisions. You know, hey, the head researcher for the COVID vaccine is an African-American female physician, right? So we didn't have that back then. We didn't have eyes on everything that could say this is okay for us. You know, um, I, I just so people know what you're talking about uh, when yeah. you mentioned Tuskegee, uh, this is an infamous uh, biomedical experiment uh, routinely now understood to be unethical, where hundreds of poor African-American men uh, were subject to a study that was conducted by the United States government, the CDC, uh, and you know other doctors were involved. And the American Medical Association. Let's and the American Medical out. Association and what they Let's did with these people. Exactly. Yeah, and they did not treat them for syphilis. And in some cases, they didn't even tell uh, the subjects of the study that they had syphilis. They told the subjects that they were getting health care that they never provided. Uh, and so mm -hmm. it, it's now understood to be a real horror. But that set of experiments took place, I think, from the 30s up until 1972. Uh, you right. and I were alive when people saw that that happened and put a stop to it. So the, the skepticism comes from a very real place. But you started to talk about why and how the front lines of medicine are different now. So tell us again, just remind the folks, Dr. Rue, about okay. how much th that there are more protections today uh, from mm -hmm. that sort of unethical behavior than there were back then. Tell us a little bit about what those protections are. Exactly. So those things, and for basic, those, what I said holds true is that we, people that look like me, African Americans are sitting at the tables where decisions are made. So it is I could not possibly foresee something similar to that Tuskegee experiment happening in this day and time because the people that were making those decisions at all levels right now have a voice. You know, they are there and they have a voice. The head researcher, right, for the COVID vaccine is an African American female physician. Okay, she is at the table helping to make decisions. People in pharmaceutical, we have pharmaceutical people who are people of color, right, who are helping to make decisions. It is unlikely that something could happen with that with all with big institutions like the government, like the American Medical Association, like the CDC. You know, we are all in all those places, you know. And watchdogs, and there are more watchdogs. People are watching. People are watching. People are watching. And our rules are tighter, right? So we have, you don't just get to go out and do any research at any time. You know, things have to be approved. You know, before your thesis, what are you trying to prove? That has to be approved. You can't just do your own research, right? So, yeah. Except the, the, you know, all those Facebook doctors out there who uh, are doing their research and telling people what's up. Uh, we right. need to put the Facebook physicians to the side. Let's move them off to the corner. Uh, so, Dr. Rue, have you encountered a, a lot of patients or a significant number of patients who are really concerned about it, who you've got to, you know, spend a lot of time uh, educating about it? Have oh, you come yes, across that? Day. Every day and every night, because I also work urgent care. So every day and every night, um, that is a regular thing. Um, I was in the bank the other day depositing checks. And so one of the tellers who, you know, who knows me, knows that I'm a physician, 
um, she, you know, came out of the back of the bank and was walking with me. And I thought she was going to lunch or something. Right. And so then after a few steps, I realized she was actually walking with me. And so, um, she says, um, you think I should get that vaccine? I was like, really? <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, so I've been, yeah, been you should get it. Her. I was like, of course I do. Do you want to live like this? Do you want to live without being with your family and celebrating uh, birthdays and holidays? Do you want to be afraid to come to work? Do you want that anxiety to continue? Well, then you need to get the vaccine. Yes, without question, you do. Let's talk about what was going on uh, in terms of the reaction to the pandemic about a year ago. Mask wearing. So, uh, you are my friend, you are a physician, you are on the front lines of this. I mean, you've been on the front lines of it since the beginning. Um, since before was it, it was like, a thing. Since before it was a thing. <laughs> since right. before it was a thing. Since before <laughs> right. there were all the Facebook doctors telling right. people what they thought uh, they knew. Yeah. Um, so what's it been like for you watching the reaction to this, yeah. especially you know, look at, if you go back to something like, you know, just the really intense resistance to wearing masks, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, where people treated masking as if it was some impingement on their freedom and liberty, and it was a, you know, sign of creeping socialism. Right. Uh, what was your reaction as a doctor, as a scientist, as somebody who has treated people and sadly watched people die uh, yeah. from this thing? Yeah. What was your reaction to all of that drama over just putting on a gosh darn mask? Yes, yes. Um, in particular, in the very beginning, um, I had no clue why people were so hesitant, right? It was sort of like that, that whole thing with the toilet paper, right? <laughs> it was like, okay, why did you pick toilet paper of all things, right? Of all I things. Mean, I mean, why would you think that it would just go away? And so it was the same thing with the mask. I really... And, and understanding, I've always worn a mask, right? So I've worn a mask for some 40 years now. But um, I did not really understand what the gist of that was, right? Well, because it um, just seems so basic. I mean, like you said, you're a physician. Your colleagues, yeah. when you are doing sensitive things with people's bodies, you yeah. wear masks so the cells and things from your body don't go into their body. It seems like two plus two plus four, but then all of a sudden... This idea of protecting one's cells from contaminating somebody else, yeah. you know, it became yeah. a big political thing and exactly. it got so politicized. Exactly. It was now the politics of the whole, whole thing, you know, when your leaders, right? And so when your leaders are not deferring to medicine and science and following along with medicine and science, I can see how people you know, ideas were swayed. They didn't know which way to go, right? So remember our leader said, oh yeah, by Easter, we're going to be sitting next to each other and it's going to be, and then that didn't work. Okay, well, it didn't work. So now, now you're going to tell me another story? Okay, so then people became fearful. Um, and so that part of it, I get. The whole thing with this not wearing a mask and not wanting to social distance, right? And not gather, I just do not understand um, people's concept of that. But really, I will tell you, I was fortunate enough to be around my circle of people, whether it was my colleagues or my family or my friends who all adhered and believed that they need to wear a mask. You it know? almost seemed like uh, for a lot of folks, you know, it was like they were showing their bravery, I guess they would describe it. You know, they had to like put their foot down and nobody was going to tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, uh, some yeah. of those folks ended up dead um, and or some of those folks ended up infecting people uh, yeah. who got very sick and, and may have died. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What were some of the toughest moments for you um, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. a doctor on the front lines during mm -hmm. the past mm -hmm. year? Uh, mm -hmm. What's been particularly tough for you? Exactly. Um, let's see. So I would say in the very beginning, you know, it was tough for me not seeing my mom. So, you know, I think I didn't see my mom for like four months, you know, straight, which is unusual. I see my mom every single week. Um, and so that was hard. 
it was hard also, you know, convincing all of my family members that this was real, right? Um, um, I remember one time I'm on a prayer line every morning and I remember on the prayer line and we don't even talk about this, but somebody blurted out, oh, this is just like the flu and you don't have to worry about it. And anyway, it doesn't affect, affect black people. I was just like, oh, whoa, 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 wait. I know this is the prayer line, but I'm going to interject just one moment here. <laughs> like, wait, hold on. God said we could take a time out. Exactly. So I could correct some very exactly. bad misinformation. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, so those were those are some frustrating things in the um, in the beginning. But I will have to tell you my heart. And I mean, I cried many days because you mm. there are horrible stories. They were horrible stories. But the worst story was on New Year's Eve, I worked urgent care. And literally every 30 or 40 minutes, there was a code blue. And for those of you who don't know, code blue is when someone's heart has stopped and we have to resuscitate them, right? And so it was code blue, um, four floor pre-op. So since no surgeries were going on, pre-op was now COVID ICU. Um, code blue um, room adjacent to the cafeteria. Why? Because now this was an ICU, right? And it was after like the third or fourth code blue, we all, the nurses and everybody in urgent care just kind of stopped and looked. And I mean, our hearts were just, it was sad. It was sad. Every 30 minutes, Every 30, someone's heart was stopping and they and, needed to be resuscitated. And, and I think that, you know, for those of us, uh, for lay people, um, yeah. it's hard to really get your head around that, you know, being yeah. in a space where every 30 minutes somebody is dying and yeah. you've got to try to resuscitate them and, and bring them back. Are you feeling like, yeah. uh, just based on your experience and your practice and what you're seeing um, at, at the hospital where you work, mm -hmm. are you feeling like there's some light at the end of the tunnel? Oh, Are we well, starting definitely. to come out of this? Well, definitely. So again, I like I said, that was around New Year's. And also at that time, the very next day on New Year's Day, I worked. And when I stepped foot into urgent care, there was a cold blue. Mm. Um, and again, I, I just, I just prayed. I was like, God, I can't do this all day. I cannot do this all day. Um, but it went on <laughs> all day. And so, um, but just this week, um, or maybe it was last week, the corridor outside of the emergency room in urgent care had been filled with about five tenths of infectious disease tents, you know, where we were screening people and treating people outside of the hospital. So it was a, you know, a protective setting. And when I went into work, um, those, those tents were all there. And when I came out, there was only one tent. Mm. Um, and so I cried then, but it was more a happy cry because it felt like we're getting there. We are defeating this, right? So not as many people are dying, not as many people are, you know, almost dying, right, to come to the hospital. So definitely I see a light. And the vaccine, I'm sure, just like when you got your vaccine, the first, even the first vaccine I got, I didn't have a lot of thought about it, but just that day, it felt a ton of stress was lifted. It just felt like we are getting somewhere <laughs> with this, right? Um, yes. It is such a good feeling. And that's what, if trying to convince people about the vaccine, that is also one of my strong points. You are going to feel 100% better just getting that vaccine, you know, that alone. Mm -hmm. My my parents uh, got it uh, almost as soon as they were able. Uh, okay. My mother, like you, uh, is from Mississippi. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, she's uh, quite a bit older than you. And so she remembers. Uh, mm -hmm. She lived through Jim Crow. She okay. remembers. Um, but she was in line to get her vaccine. <laughs> my father grew up in West Virginia, uh, uh, moved to Pennsylvania. He yeah. was waiting. And, I mean, they wanted that vaccine. And it was so funny because after they got vaccinated, I remember dad called me and he was like, it just feels different. He was like, I feel like I, I it seems like the world is different. I mean, exactly. it, you know, that was just and I, I was the same. I mean, yeah. I was 
I was exhilarated. Yeah. I, you know, still yeah. take precautions. I still yeah. wear a mask. Yeah. But it, it's nice to know that um, it's nice to know we've got that protection. Uh, we've got that protection. And yeah. remind people also, doctor, uh -huh. every single one of these vaccines will keep people from being hospitalized and or dying, correct? They've all been 100, they've all been proven to be 100% effective uh, exactly. as against those outcomes. They've all been proven to be effective um, and all of them um, um, will keep you from dying. And that's a key thing that you just said, it will keep you from dying. So you still may get the virus, but if, if you're like me, why you do all the precautions is because as I tell people, I don't wanna get asymptomatic COVID either. I don't want to get any of that, right? And so, but the fact to know that you're not going to die, that you're not going to actually die alone in a hospital somewhere is another part of that, right? Um, you, you have to get a vaccine. You have to get a vaccine. So some states uh, have talked about instituting these vaccine passports where in order to have access to certain facilities or public buildings or, you know, go in large groups, you yeah. would have to show a card, you know, something that indicates that you've been vaccinated. Uh, yeah. Some people say that that really implicates privacy concerns, yeah. uh, issues of uh, medical and health privacy. What do you think about that? You know, in terms mm -hmm. of what you know about the contagiousness of COVID, uh, mm -hmm. what do you think about requiring people to demonstrate or to prove uh, their their vaccination status before they can say go to a concert. So now I can definitely I can definitely see both sides of that, right? Both sides of that. I can see where people would say, well, people are prying into their lives, and you know, this is my health, and it's supposed to be private because we did you know sign these HIPAA agreements that says that things are private. Right. However, when it is a public health issue, which is exactly what this is, right? Your decision could very well affect me. It could very well affect my health. And so we have to be concerned about public health. We have to be. And particularly now, and probably in the next four or five years, because until we get, you know, control of this vaccine, then I have to agree with the passports. I really do. Um, and then people, if you have made that decision um, that you're not going to get a vaccine, right, then you have to live with the consequences that comes with that. And so it's um, if you decide you're not getting a vaccine, you're going to concerts, like you mentioned, that should be limited. A point you made is that what makes this pandemic so different is just the ease with which people can transmit this thing. So before we go, speaking of science, speaking of education, uh, you're an HBCU grad like me. You went to Xavier. That's right. <laughs> UCLA School of Medicine. Yeah. Um, we met, uh, we're both members of the Beverly Hills West chapter of the Lynx Incorporated. You yep. are our newly elected president. One of the things that the Lynx uh, do, of which I'm something, uh, one of the many things of which I'm particularly proud, um, are our scholarships. Uh, we give scholarships to kids uh, who need uh, some extra help. Mm -hmm. And but I, I just it would be remiss of me as somebody who really has everything that I have because of education. You know, my parents didn't have trust funds to leave me or starter right. money. You know, I didn't have right. starter money. Um, right. They were there. They focused on education. They made sure I got it. They fought to go. make sure that I get it. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm, I'm so pleased that uh, we in the links are able to help other people children, uh, children, young people, <laughs> help young people <laughs> I know. get an education. The kids. Yeah, the kids. You're the right. kids. But before you go, doctor, just say a little bit about why it is so important that we educate our young people and that they get the best education possible. I think it is the only way out. So mm -hmm. let mm -hmm. me, uh, let's hear your, your, your very valuable 
Uh, I was going to say two cents. Let's hear your $100 on it because, you know, you're another one. I mean, you know, a doctor from one of the finest institutions in the country. um, Tell, just remind folks, like, why we got to keep kids in the books. Exactly. Exactly. Well, of course, education is, has always been our gift, right? It is our gift and our ticket outside to do better and better things, to learn how to use our voice. So no matter um, what that education, whether it's in science or English or communications, it is our gift to be able to create our voice and to make sure that our voice is heard. So we definitely believe in that. One of the things that we do with the links, not only to give scholarships, is mentoring. So I am a big fan and component of mentoring. So I mentor, you know, to young girls who want to be physicians, um, you know, mentor to people who are already in college and just want to be college, people who are in the workforce, but they have to know our struggles. They have to know that, you know, nothing is new under the sun. And we don't have to fix their life. We don't have to work it out for them, but we just have to show them that we are everyday people who are successful. That, that, that's what we have to show them. And so that mentoring part, um, what I do like about our chat, the Beverly Hills West chapter of the Lynx and many other chapters in the Lynx is that it is not just giving a scholarship, it is getting to know those students. It is staying with them throughout the course of their education. It is going with them with the bumps and bruises or with the rewards, you know? So we are with them every step of the way. And I think that that mentoring and the scholarship component go hand in hand. And hand I'm proud hand. of us that we do that. I'm I sure am us. too. Um, and I'm uh, very proud to work with you on that. Dr. Cheryl Rue, my friend, Uh, Thank you for this information. Thank you for reminding people to get vaccinated. Get vaccinated. Uh, Thank you for making science real. Thank you for being a mentor. And thank you really for being a champion, uh, a champion for healthcare. I love you. Appreciate you. Thank you for having me. It is my pleasure. Thank you. You're going to have to come back. You're going to have to come back. All right. Thanks, Cheryl. All right. Thank you. Have a good one.